In normal lungs, we see background lung tissue, the larger airways and vessels, and the fissures. The background lung is 20% tissue and 80% air, and has a certain uniform grayness that you'll learn to recognize. It is lighter than the black color of the airways, but darker than the light color of the subcutaneous fat. The attenuation is generally homogeneous, although when the patient is lying supine, as they do in a CT scanner, the weight of the non-dependent lungs can cause a little atelectasis in the dependent lung, increasing its density and making it look whiter. If you are concerned about pathology, rescan the patient in a prone position. If it goes away, it was simply atelectasis. A key anatomic feature of the lung that determines how lung pathology appears on CT is the secondary pulmonary lobule. As the airways move from the hyla out to the periphery, they change from conducting airways to respiratory airways and ultimately to asini and alveoli. To support these smaller structures, the lung is organized into secondary pulmonary lobules as shown in this close-up diagram. These are 1 to 2.5 centimeter polyhedral structures. Each is supplied by a small bronchiole and a pulmonary arterial and is bounded by connective tissue forming interlobular septa. These septa contain draining venules and lymphatics. Bronchi and pulmonary arteries run together and branch in parallel. Arteries divide into two branches of similar size, each smaller than the parent vessel. The airways and arteries smoothly taper as they move from the center to the periphery. Veins run independently of the arteries and airways. They also taper as they move peripherally, but rather than dividing into just two branches like the arteries, veins have multiple branches, generally at right angles to the parent vessel. The diameter of the artery and the accompanying bronchus should be about the same. This is called the arterial bronchial ratio. It is very useful in evaluating the pulmonary vasculature since the bronchus, made of cartilage, doesn't change size with increased pulmonary vascular pressures while the artery does. Normally, the ratio is 1 to 1, with the arteries being a bit larger in the dependent lung and a bit smaller in the non-dependent lung due to gravity. If the artery is larger than the bronchus, it's a sign of increased vascular pressure. If the bronchus is larger than the artery, assuming normal vascular pressures, then it may indicate bronchiectasis. Assessing the bronchial wall is always problematic. The wall should appear thin, about 10% of the diameter of the bronchus, but this evaluation is very subjective with high inter-observer variability. One of the best descriptions I've heard is that if the wall looks like it was drawn with a sharp pencil, then it's normal. But if it looks like it was drawn with a crayon, then it's too thick. For me, since wall thickening rarely indicates anything in the absence of other radiologic or clinical findings, I tend to be conservative and not report it unless the walls are markedly thickened or there are associated findings. No lung markings can be seen within one centimeter of the pleura. This means that in this area, there are no visible airways, vasculature, or interstitium in the subpleural space. The pleura is found at the lung edges and should be smooth, uniform, and sharply defined. Since normal pleura is less than one millimeter thick, it's usually not visible unless you're looking along a fissure. Only about 20% of people have all three complete fissures, which include the right oblique and horizontal, and the left oblique. Commonly, fissures are incomplete, or accessory fissures exist. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from, and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.